sharing up there. Okay, great. So I want to walk people through the school closure matrix and what it is and, and, and what it isn't um, so that everybody kind of understands uh, what we've created here. If you recall, uh, the, the district, the administration originally did not provide a matrix uh, with our back to school uh, blueprint uh, because it's, it is kind of challenging to put something like this together. And um, it, it is somewhat of our, our best you know, look at things, trying to look at what, what are the parameters that uh, public health has and, and CDC and also what we think is, is somewhat reasonable. Um, and so as we originally put this thing together, um, we looked at some of the same numbers here uh, as we looked at our school closure matrix. So this is the school masking matrix. And so one of the, one of the things I just want to talk through, the, the numbers at the top, okay, the state on Tuesday of last week uh, decided to go from um, making the numbers being seven-day averages uh, as far as, as they reported for school districts to seven-day cumulative numbers. And so, uh, so all we've done is we took our original uh, spans of numbers, we times them by seven uh, versus the, um, you know, what they were before. And so uh, that's that number, and I'm going to show you here in just a minute where you can find that online. A lot of people are wondering, okay, where, where do we get that number? How does that you know, how does that come up? And so I'm going to show people, you know, where we, where we pull that number online. Yep. Can you also just uh, kind of walk through uh, in relation to how that was comparatively to how we were looking at the numbers as a board last year? Yep. So last year in this first column here, the zero to 70 uh, was zero to 10. You know, in the second column was uh, essentially 11, uh, 11 to 20. And then uh, uh, we had you know, uh, 20 to uh, 20 to 30, uh, 30 to 40, and then 40 plus. So really all we did was take each of the numbers and multiply them by seven to pull the average out of it to make it be a cumulative number instead of an average number. Um, so, but the, the numbers would be the same as we had last year as far as, and these are, these are um, over just in the school district boundary. And so I am going to, if I can, uh, let's see here, hold on. So this is the website, the Wisconsin Department of Health and Services. This is the website we've been using to pull our data from all year last year, all summer long, and, and so far this fall. Um, it, you can see, I believe, at the top of the page, the uh, address is just dhs.wisconsin.gov uh, slash COVID-19 dash data. When you slide down, what it is, it's the summary page. So you can see, you know, they have the state data on this page. Um, you know, the seven, they have seven day averages when it comes to counties and things like that, vaccine rates and, and things along those lines. But then really what we're doing is we're going all the way down here to the bottom. And this, this map that they have here is to be able to look at cases by uh, different geographic locations. So when you, when you zoom in here, you can click on St. Croix County, for example, and you can see that over the last seven days, there's been 184 cases of COVID-19 in St. Croix County. The top number, the 203, is they basically extrapolate that up to 100 per 100,000 cases. And the reason they do that is because you have big disparities in the size of counties and they want to try to get to, you know, comparing apples to apples. So everything's based on per 100,000. So since we have about 91,000 residents, that's why it gets, it gets ramped up. But one of the other things you can do on this website is you can look at it by village, city, and town. But the number that we're really looking at, or at least the board uh, had instructed us to look at last year when this came out, I think uh, about uh, halfway through the fall, was the school district boundary numbers. And so what we're able to do is to, to drill in on this map and see, okay, how do, we, how do we compare as a school district? And so the number that, that goes basically that determines which box we're in or which column we're in at the top of the matrix is you click on the district and it says over the past seven days per 100,000, how many cases have we had in the school district boundary? Now, we've only actually had 154, or sorry, 54 cases, but it says 172.2 because we only have 31,000 residents in the school district. So they ramp it up per 100,000. That's how they get to the 172.2. 
that that is the numbers we've been we've been using all along. We've been looking at this number. We've been using these numbers all along. It's on this page. Um, it's very accessible. It's just towards the bottom of the page. So if people are ever wondering where are you pulling your data, that's that's where we're pulling our, our numbers from when it comes to uh, number of cases within the school district boundary. And and again, that's all residents within the school district boundary, not just uh, students that, that happen to be in the school district boundary. So I just wanted to make sure that I um, showed where, uh, where that was. So going back to the school district matrix, the number that I was just showing you would, would determine which column we are in across the top here. Uh, so uh, at 172.2, it would put us in this third column right here. So which, maybe that's me, I don't know. Okay. Um, so what that does is then what happens is then we start to look at how many cases have we had in each of the buildings. Because one of the, the guiding principles or one of the things that the board asked us to do is to look at it by building and try to weight what's going on in the buildings uh, a little bit heavier than, than what is necessarily happening out in the community. And so these numbers on the left-hand side for each of the buildings represent roughly about a half a percent interval of all the people that would be assigned to that building, students and staff. And so, you know, there's about 2,000 students at the high school. So it's about, you know, uh, less than 11 or 10 would be about a half a percent. And then you can kind of go on and so forth. At the middle school here, you can see, um, you know, when we figure in all the staff and students and everybody in that building, uh, it's, it's about 1,400, so it's about seven is a, half, is a half a percent. At the elementaries, because they're smaller buildings, uh, we basically broke it into two delineations. We have our big buildings, which are uh, E.P. Rock, Hudson Prairie, and Rivercrest, um, and it's about a half a percent, but when you have such small buildings, you know, it can, you have to round up or you have to run down, round down, and then they all have the same, same counts, and then at North Hudson, Holton and Willow, they have, again, the same counts down the side. So for example, when people ask, okay, when would we go to mask required? So if, if for example, this was a regular week and we've been in school, according to the matrix at EP Rock Elementary, if we happen to have seven cases in the last seven days, based on what's happening in our school district, we would be requiring masks in that building until the next period, reporting period, which would be the next Friday. Okay. Um, yes. So if, yeah. And so what would happen is let's say they only had six cases. We would be at mask optional for the following week. And so go ahead. I guess just to make a comment here and, and thinking about where we left this as a board, uh, as well. And granted, it's a different matrix, but we followed a matrix and the matrix was, was really more of a guide. Um, you know, so in, in a couple of instances, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's just important to note, this is a guide. It doesn't mean it's, it's hard and fast. So if we were right on the line and uh, in both uh, uh, matrices, uh, that it just may make sense for us to say, listen, let's just hold off. So we did that in one instance where we were just over the line, but uh, we thought that it was uh, not enough for us to go hybrid at that uh, juncture. Um, so I just think it, it's for us and, and this would be something we'll need to decide upon as well. But, um, you know, really, is this uh, still a guide or is it hard and fast? Because for uh, the way that we had left it previously as a board was it's, it's just a guide. It's another data point that we use uh, to help us make decisions. So, uh, so with that being said, so each of the buildings, um, you know, we've, we've had people that have obviously responded, uh, given feedback. We have some people that feel that this matrix creates a situation where we're going to put kids in masks for the whole year and they can never get out of it. And some people look at this matrix and say, we're never going to get high enough that we're ever going to get to require a mask. And that's a problem. And so it's interesting as, as two different people look at the exact same matrix, they can have two very different takes on it. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is our, our, our best try at it. It, it. The board is more than welcome to say, we don't like this. We would rather see totals different. Um, that the, we did look back at last year's totals and, and tried to figure out, okay, what um, on average, you know, how many did we see in a week? 
or what was our highest week? What was some of our lowest weeks? Um, and, you know, we did have weeks where we hate, we were in the thirties at the high school or two week periods where we we're in thirties at the high school. Um, you know, we had weeks, uh, when I think, especially North Hudson elementary, where we got into, you know, a couple double digit situations over two weeks, but, you know, for the most part last year, our elementaries didn't have very many cases at all. And, um, you know, our high school kind of ebbed and flowed and our middle school was kind of somewhere, somewhere in between, but that's, that's kind of the, the background on, on the matrix. So it's about a half a percent intervals on the left hand, on the left hand side. And then again, these numbers across the top, you know, some people have asked us um, why, why not just have the numbers across the top correlate with what the low median or low moderate uh, high and really high levels are according to uh, the CDC. And we, we can absolutely do that. One of the challenges that we have looked at is some of those, in order for us to get too low uh, in the Hudson School District, we'd have to have fewer than three cases in seven days out of the entire, you know, 30, you know, 31,000 people that live here. It may be hard to get there. I think when we look back, we may have only hit that a couple weeks over the last, you know, 15 months. Um, and they were, you know, June, July. And so what we try to do is take somewhat of a reasonable approach where we were weighing a little bit more what was happening in the building, a little bit less of what was happening out in the community as, as we put this together. Um, there is, there's, there's not a, uh, some people say, what's the scientific basis of this? A lot of it is trial and error. A lot of it's looking at what we did last year. Did it work? Did it not work? It's a little bit different this year because we're not talking about changing educational delivery models. I mean, we're really talking about whether it's mass mandatory or mass recommended or optional. Um, so it's not the same level of inconvenience to parents. That's part of the reason why we said this would happen on a Friday and then it would implement on Monday uh, versus before we, if you remember last year, we were, um, we were making the decision on a Wednesday and it was implementing the following Monday. And the biggest reason was because if we changed our educational model, especially for elementary parents, they might have to have childcare lined up. And we wanted to make sure we gave them plenty of time to have childcare lined up uh, as we work through that. So with that being said on the matrix, I'm more than welcome to answer any questions. Yeah, I think uh, one that's also just maybe think about how we want to look at the matrix itself. Do we want to include it as part of the back to school blueprint or do we want to maintain this as a document that we again, just use as a guide. Um, so I think that's something that uh, we need to provide some guidance back to Nick and the administration on so that, uh, you know, we're giving them the right direction. Okay. Any questions? Heather. Is it on? Okay. Nick, can you clarify? You said the numbers across the top are roughly the same as last year. They're just adjusted for the new way that they're measuring. Correct. Um, the numbers on the left hand side, if I'm remembering correctly, that last year we used 1% and this year we're using a half percent. Is that what That's you correct. Said? So the, the numbers are half because last year, if you remember, we were doing two week totals versus this year we're doing basically one week totals. So we had, we had 14 days, the, the numbers over 14 days. And so we felt we would reduce the numbers by half because we're only looking at half as, half as much time. Um, but, but essentially it's, uh, it would be equivalent to the same amount of numbers we, that were guiding our decisions last year. Got it. So that makes sense. And that's one of the concerns I have with this is if this is, if the color patterns and the progress are basically what we used last year to guide our, are we in person or not? And last year we were able to keep our elementary school kids in person all year. Mm -hmm. So when I look like at EP rocks numbers from last year, those were two week numbers. So if you have them, there was never a time last year when masks would have been required at EP rock if we were using this, this guide. So to me, that's an indication that the guide, that the numbers are too high because mm -hmm. I think not everyone, but many people felt like being in school last year was a good thing. And it was a good that we opted to do it and had kids wearing masks to keep those, especially younger kids in school all year. So to me, that the fact that if you look at a school like EP Rock and say, I mean, cause there's nothing on that top line where the community numbers would weigh in. So there was never a period at AP Rock last year where had we been using this, they would have been required to wear masks. Is that correct? Am I interpreting it correctly? 
Yeah. So if you look at this, basically what we're saying for an EP rocks um, on the, uh, on the matrix there, we're basically saying if, if there were two or fewer cases at EP rock, regardless of what, what's going on in the community, a uh, mask would remain optional. And again, we just, this was from the feedback we from the board, which was, we want you to weigh heavier what's happening in buildings than what's happening in the community. Now, um, because the concern was if you had uh, an outbreak or something along those lines at let's say um, uh, at Presbyterian homes or something like that, or at the hospital or something along those lines, all of a sudden you could be running along being just fine at EPR Elementary, but we could be making changes based on what's happening in a very isolated part of our, of our district. Originally it was the county, because if you remember originally we were looking at county numbers and then we were able to drill down with district numbers. Yep. With the percentage change in that top line, you know, and how the numbers are being reported out on the, that website, that's also changed, thus that's increased our numbers, correct? So up here, you had talked about the zero to 70, the 71 to, last year that would have been like zero to 10, 11 to 20. And because they changed how they're uh, providing the, the numbers out on their website, we've since increased those numbers. Yes. So I think that it has to take into consideration some of that because what we're seeing here isn't an exact correlation to the number of cases that actually would need to be happening in our community. I get it, but it's measuring the same thing. It's just, we're changing the numbers that we're using. So the zero to 70 is seven times mm -hmm. the number that was there previously. Yep. So it's essentially the same stuff would have to happen to move throughout the grid this year as last year. Yeah. yeah, because that was kind of confusing for people last year because you had to kind of do, you remember the state kind of changed it multiple times and then we had to do calculations and uh, they went from seven day averages to 14 day and, and they kind of bounced around, which really made us have to make some adjustments and people would say, well, I feel like you're, you know, where are you getting this exact number? And we, we show them exactly. So like I said, that's why I thought it was important to show the website in where we're pulling all the data. That's where we've been pulling the data from um, to, to get to this 100,000 um, population. Now, you could easily say, we don't want to use the 100,000 population. We want to just have it be straight numbers. Don't extrapolate it up. Fine. Uh, then we could turn around and instead of having it be zero to 70, we basically would divide each of these numbers at the top by three is essentially what it is. So it, whatever way you do it, it's you know, be consistent in the numbers. Um, the goal is not to make the numbers do any one thing. I mean, we, we didn't build this to ensure that masks are optional all year, and we didn't build this to ensure that masks are required all year. Um, we felt like what we had going on here was um, there are some great recommendations from the CDC. We believe the CDC has good recommendations, um, and we would recommend mask wearing as well. Uh, but we also know that there are some recommendations that the CDC does make that we just aren't able to implement. We just, or, or they are at such a level um, that you would, we find them to be somewhat unreasonable or what people would be willing to do. And, and that's why we tried to change the columns at the top. If people would say, you know, we'd rather have those columns changed or, or we'd rather have something else done with it, um, you know, we're, we're more than happy to more than happy to make those adjustments. You know, if you look at the top, really, it is set up so that um, if we're not seeing cases at all, or very few cases in our buildings, regardless of what's going on in the community, we we stay steady. However, even if the numbers look really good in the community, and we're seeing a lot of cases in our buildings, it causes us to mask. I mean, it's, it, I'm sure everybody can pick up on the fact it's, it's, it's basically a mirror of its, of itself. So. Um, I appreciate the fact that the, this is broken up between schools. Um, my concern about it, and I couldn't hear you very well, Heather. So I, I feel bad if I'm missing a point here, but my concern is kind of what you said, Nick, that if there's an issue going on, say at the hospital, that that's gonna largely affect what's going on at each school. 
school. And so I guess when I look at it, I have somewhat of a thought to keep it with the schools to see how many positivity rates are there as opposed to what's going on in the district community. So you're saying, so it's really hard to hear up here. So, so what you're saying is move, you know, you would just eliminate the community numbers and then instead of having a matrix, you just basically have four levels or five levels. That's my thought. Okay. I, I guess the only comment to that is if, if the community numbers are even at the maximum, and we don't have any cases in our schools, it's still mask optional. It's still what? Mask optional. Oh. Because it stays along the top, right? I mean, the, the, that's the intent is to make sure, just like we did last year, to, to keep it to that school level. Because if one school is having an outbreak, doesn't mean we would want to close all the elementaries. Because that just wouldn't make any sense if one school is having an outbreak, but the other elementaries have no or little cases, then we wouldn't close them. So that's why on the, on the top line there, it would remain mask optional if the case count at an individual school and all individual schools would be at, at essentially zero to whatever it would be, 10. At what, at what level was that? Bruce? The first level in the schools? Yeah, it would be, you know, at the high school it would be 10, but I mean, it, you know, and then it, the it varies at the elementary, yes. Two. Um, you know, Holton, for example, if they have more than one case, they they kick into the they kick into that next line. I mean, it it, it goes it goes pretty quick into into mask required. Um, if things are really out of hand in the community, and we get into you know two cases, I mean, it would not be uncommon uh, for us to see uh, us operating probably at least for the next few weeks somewhere in the right three columns would be my guess based on what the numbers have been doing. I don't think we're going to be operating in the first two columns over the next three or four weeks. I mean, that would mean that we'd have to see a tremendous drop in cases. Maybe, I mean, it'd be great, but it, all signs point to, you know, we're probably operating in the right three columns up here uh, more than likely. Say Nick, one of the other things that we did at the end of last year was um, break it down even within a school into a class, particularly in the elementaries. Is that still the intent with this uh, matrix where we would yep. require a, a class to mask versus the entire school or so, what's the thought there? So this is, this is by school versus by class. We talked about that at the cabinet level, trying to figure out what would be the best way to do it. If you remember when we did this last year, um, this is actually a much more restrictive maintenance uh, matrix at the elementary than what we had last year, because last year uh, we weren't changing our instructional model until we had, I think it was four cases in a classroom. Um, you know, we could have four different cases in four different classrooms and nothing was going to change. Um, and that's, you know, we had gone, we had changed that model. Now, again, I believe changing instructional model is a much bigger deal than Side, am I going to wear a mask or am I not going to wear a mask type of thing? Because it has implications on, you know, people's work schedules and, and, and things along those lines. Um, but yeah, last year, um, you know, for example, we, we could have had 20 cases at EP Rock and had them been in 10 different classrooms and we would have done nothing different because it was, you know, I think fewer than four cases. Uh, in, in each classroom. And so, um, so there are parts of this that are definitely more, um, you know, conservative and there are definitely parts of this that are a little bit more liberal in how we're looking at things. Um, so it's not a true where we ended the year. Now we started, if you remember, we started the year, we were by building and then, you know, about in January, the high school and middle school, uh, we still did the building and then that's when the elementaries decided, you know, we went to the classroom in the elementaries and then we hit about March, end of March. And we said, okay, we're moving away from the school closure matrix altogether. And we're making the commitment that as long as we can staff our buildings, we're going to continue to have in-person instruction. And that's what took us through the end of the year. Um, if, if you remember, as we work through that. Any other questions? Kate? My thought was, and I'm not sure if I 
made it clear is to have four columns for each building of the kids who are testing positive. So we'd still look at each building. Yes. We, okay. Yeah. So for example, you know, it's, you're, you're looking at Holton. So if you have four cases at EP Rock, mm -hmm. EP Rock is, could potentially be wearing masks and Holton could be you know, strongly recommending. And I think, you know, one of the things I think that we could do come out a little bit stronger with their language going from just saying optional to saying we need to strongly recommend versus, you know, to be more aligned with what the CDC is doing. And, and I think, you know, we've talked about, I think I've talked to board members about it is the CDC does have the authority to mandate masks in our buildings. They mandate masks on our buses and we're going to follow that because it's the federal law as we sit. Um, but they chose to recommend. They have not chosen to mandate. Um, you know, we believe public health has the ability to mandate because Dane County has put a man mass mandate in place. Now, St. Croix County doesn't have an ordinance that allows them to do that, but if they chose that route, they could do that. So um, by recommending, uh, strongly recommending wearing masks, and then on top of that, creating a matrix where we would go beyond even that, uh, where we'd be mandating at certain points, I believe would be going above and beyond what the CDC is is doing because they haven't, they're not putting the mandates in place that they have the actual, they have the authority to do. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that, you know, we could definitely come out with stronger language on, you know, strongly recommending at times when they're optional or recommended versus times when they're mandated. Uh, my question would be whether we adopt this or not, as it is. Uh, could you put the link with somewhere like at the bottom of the matrix so that folks can easily click to see where, where we, they would find that 172 point whatever mm -hmm. that, that's like today's rate or whenever that was? Yeah, and I'll work with Tracy on the website. We'll get it embedded in our website. And then we can also embed it in our communication that goes out on Fridays where people will be able to go right to that go right to that website and, and click on that link so that they can go down to the bottom, see exactly what we're, where we're pulling the data. I mean, there's, there's no goal to, to do any type of sleight of hand or, or any type of not being transparent or anything like that. I, I know we've gotten some of those emails. Um, we want everybody to see exactly where we're, we're pulling the data. Now, there are times when if you go to the county's website and you go to the state's website, the data doesn't match up. And uh, it doesn't, um, and the county sometimes is not very consistent in getting their data out there on a regular basis. And so that's why pretty early on in the pandemic back in, I want to say as early as July of last year, we made the decision to go to this website, DHS's website, because they were consistently getting the data up on a daily basis uh, so that we could track it that way. So there are times when you might go to St. Croix County's website and it may have conflicting data with what's on the state's website. We've chosen that we're going to utilize the state website as the, the default of where we're going to pull our information. Thank you. Uh, one other question, if, again, whether or not we adopt this or not, um, I would say one of the uh, guidelines rather than a hard and fast rule would be particularly in elementaries where um, siblings would drive up that number uh, rather than looking at the entire school if it's in particular one family that's uh, got the cases. So are, are you saying you want to treat siblings as kind of one case instead of multiple cases? Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes. So if you had like say a family that had a first grader and a third grader at EP Rock, they would count as one case at EP Rock as far as the matrix go versus counting as two cases. If they were both again, possible. I wouldn't say that's hard and fast, but to to look at that with more leeway. Okay. Yeah. No. I we're open to whatever feedback. Mr. Vice President. So I would agree with Carrie to uh, to a point on that because I remember during last year we did see more spread from at home in families that it's kind of skewed our numbers, and I believe that's why we made some of the changes. So I would be in favor of that as well, looking at, at least looking at it if we were close, closer borderline. Yeah, no, I, 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 I think that's fine. I mean, it, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, we are seeing the most contagious cases are coming when one person in the family gets it, other people are getting it. Now it's not a hard and fast rule that everybody in the family is gonna get it. And, uh, but 
uh, we're seeing more times than not when you have at least one positive case in the family, at least one other person is testing positive in the family if they haven't been vaccinated or if they haven't already had already had COVID. And so, um, yeah, if that's if that's the way you would like us to count, if that's what the, the board in the end wants us to do, we, we absolutely can count it that way. Any other questions, Tom, Carrie? Very talkative tonight, Carrie. One comment only would be that uh, when you say that that's what, what we're seeing, I would say historically that's what we're seeing. And it, it may be a not completely different situation this year, but it might be um, a much more contagious variant with children if, um, if the rest of the country proves to, to be correct here as well. So I think we just need to be cognizant that uh, we're probably not going to be spared this and it will probably affect our children much more this year. Yeah, I think um, there's, there's no doubt about it. The, the Delta variant is a much, much more contagious variant. It seems to be proportionately more contagious for kids as it is for adults. Um, and, uh, you know, so we are seeing more kids get it. I think uh, in the numbers, as you kind of track the different numbers, you're seeing uh, youth that are getting it, um, which kind of, you know, leads to Heather's point a little bit is we probably hit some of these numbers quicker than we would have hit them last year. Um, because, you know, the level of, of contagiancy uh, that it is, but, um, you know, it's, it, again, we may be back here in a few weeks saying to you, hey, this is just, it's, it, this isn't working the way we need it to work and we need some more flexibility to make some adjustments. Um, you know, we try to tell people that the name of the game this year is flexibility because, you know, we have people that will call us for open enrollment and say, hey, can I open enrollment in because I hear your district's optional and my district's mandatory or vice versa. And it's, uh, we, you can, but we, you know, we're not going to guarantee that we're going to be optional all year and we're not going to guarantee we're going to be mandatory all year. So, you know, if people are making decisions about where they want to send their kid to school based on that, um, I would tell them from my professional opinion as an educator that that's not a, I, I wouldn't advise that that would be a good, good reason to switch schools because every school district I'm talking to in this area, it is a fluid situation and uh, they're going to be responsive based on what they're seeing the numbers do. And so, um, but, you know, every, you know, people have the, the ability to, to make those decisions. But um, what I would always tell them is it's not really great on kids to move them in and out of schools back and forth based on masking or not masking. So other questions about the matrix? Yep. Okay. Oh. Sorry, I was looking that way. Uh Nick, can you speak to it all what other schools have been trending at? Like, I, I think some of the private schools have not done masking perhaps last year You know, or the summer school. I know we've talked about that. Um, so I'm not aware of the, the private schools of whether they've masked or not. I know, I think St. Pat's kind of followed our lead. Carrie, you worked there um, and kind of did the same things we were doing. I'm not sure what Trinity did. Um, the... I know for a good portion of the year, all the way up until March, I mean, there was a mandate that the governor required, you know, mask, I think all the way up until sometime in March uh, or, or beginning of April. Uh, as far as summer school goes and summer programming, um, we've had lots of kids in our programs. You know, some people would argue that we don't have as many kids in our programs as we have in a school year. And I would say you're absolutely correct. We don't have as many kids in our summer programming as we would have in a typical school year. Um, but we have had a lot of a lot of kids in the program and, and um, we did finish up summer school just I think it was two weeks ago, Dave, is that when we finished summer school and we've been keeping an eye on things um, with, you know, how that went. We were mask optional uh, at, at summer school. We're continuing to mask optional um, with our programming uh, and it's it's been all right. But again, it's hard to know. I mean, is the Delta variant been here all summer? Has it been here? for the last week? Has it been here for, for five weeks? You know, it's, it's kind of hard to know. I think this new variant is, is obviously definitely a, a game changer for us um, as, we, as, we look at, as we look at some of these things. Heather? So two things. One, I wonder, um, just to keep things simple, 
if it wouldn't make sense to use the public health categories across the top, and then we wouldn't necessarily have to follow the guidance that schools wear masks at every level. You know, so public health has their com their categories of low, moderate, um, substantial, and high, I think. Mm -hmm. It would be certainly easier for parents to find that information. So that's one thought. Um, I'm also, given the high transmission of the Delta variant, not so sure that keeping focused on Hudson School District numbers makes sense. Um, we don't live in a bubble. You know, I think probably 50% of people who live in Hudson drive somewhere else for work, folks who are still going to an office to work. Um, and so I think keeping this focused on just Hudson doesn't seem very logical given that this is a global virus and that this strain is four or more times more catching than the previous strain. Um, so that's my second thought. And then I, my third thought, I guess, is just more philosophical. Um, when we have a way to prevent spread and then we choose instead to wait to use that method until a whole bunch of people are already sick or have unknowingly transmitted the virus to people who got sick and potentially were hospitalized, potentially died. That seems really reactive to me. And if our goal here, well, we're all concerned about kids not getting sick, kids not dying, people in their family not dying. As a school board, our focus is on education. And so I think our shared goal is that we believe that our kids learn best, the vast majority of learn, kids learn best when they are in school in face-to-face -face education. By not acting proactively now, we are running the risk that kids get pulled out of school. And when they're sick or a close contact, this year they're not gonna have a, um, an option to keep learning uh, rem remotely. Um, so that's, they're gonna miss in-person school while they're sick or while they're quarantined. And perhaps even more importantly, as we're now seeing breakthrough cases, um, we run the risk that we won't have enough staff to run our schools because they're sick. So they're out sick, they're out quarantined. And so just from a philosophical standpoint, not being proactive, not acting to prevent something instead of waiting until it happens and then reacting to it uh, just feels wrong. So are, are you calling that we don't use the matrix or what, what are you uh, calling to question there? Are you calling to question whether or not we should follow this matrix or not follow this matrix? Well, I guess I'm calling two things. I think I guess I'm making two points. One, I think the matrix is is too loose. If we're going to use a matrix, I think it's too loose. Um, and I'm questioning whether we should be starting with starting at a point of no masks or starting at a prevention point where we're wearing, wearing masks. So I'm I'm personally struggling with both of those things, Bruce. Okay. Any other comments, questions? I do. Kate. I guess I don't think that we know specifically what this variant is gonna do or what COVID's doing. I think we've talked about fluidity and I think that's important as a board and a school that we can keep that with each board meeting um, and start to look at what the severity is of this variant. If this is similar to a flu or a cold, at what point do we stop tracking this? So I think it's important that we just continue each time to talk about it. I personally feel like the matrix is on the other side. <laughs> so I know that's always the case. And certainly parents have that ability to send their kids masked. I, I have actually seen the kids probably more respectful sometimes than adults with if people decide to wear a mask or not. And I, I've heard too from a lot of people talking about the 
psychosocial effects of the mask that sometimes I think is forgotten, but kids who are hearing impaired or special needs or with mental health issues, I know that a lot of people have brought up concerns about masking with those kids. You know, we've, we, you know, we masked all last year um, and had very little issue with it, with our kids with special needs uh, as far as the, um, uh, you know, their ability to wear the mask and, and things along those lines, or even, you know, the, our, our big concern at the beginning of last year, I think it was a lot of people's concern is, you know, some of our youngest learners, our littlest learners, are they going to be able to wear the mask? I mean, you know, that was, that was, a, that was a big question and a challenge last year and it wasn't perfect. And there were times when they were tired of wearing them. Heck, I was tired of wearing them. Um, you know, I think there's no doubt about it. Um, and so what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to find somewhat of a level of, of reasonableness as we, you know, as we implement this, um, you know, or when we came up with this. And so, like I said, I, I, you know, Heather's looking at this and saying, hey, this is way too loose of a matrix. And Kate's looking at this and saying, this is way too, you know, tight of a matrix. It's just, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, trying, to, trying to find some level of, of reasonableness is really what we're, we're shooting for, knowing that no matter what we decide, um, we will tick off a group of people. Uh, and right now it seems like we're ticking off both groups of people, um, you know, on, on, on both sides. Um, so uh, that's, that's kind of our, you know, as we're trying to find what we think is, is reasonable and, and people talk about proactive versus reactive. Um, I think this is a reasonably proactive approach. I mean, we're not talking about needing the elementaries to get to 20, 30, 40 cases before we decide to do something. I mean, at our elementaries were, you know, in single digit type of cases. Um, and in some cases, especially if it's pretty prevalent out in the community, we're talking about two cases in the elementary. So it's, it's not as though we're, we're saying, hey, we're throwing the kids to the wolves and we're gonna let it get to you know, 50, 60 cases at EP Rock Elementary before we decide to do something. So I don't think that's uh, necessarily a fair assessment. Um, but I also, uh, would understand where people would say you have the option to be proactive and, and to stop any cases. I, I just, whether we have masks or don't have masks, I don't believe we're going to be able to be COVID free. We had that conversation last year when we said we were going to open our buildings. We said, we're going to have cases. We did have cases. We had over 500 cases in the district last year. Um, and we were still able to kind of manage moving forward. So um, I think we're, you know, again, if there is tweaks to the numbers, or if you say, "Hey, we don't, we don't want to do the the matrix at all," remember, we didn't. This wasn't a administrative. Hey, we think you guys should do the matrix. This was in response to the board asking us to put the matrix together uh, a week and a half, uh, a week and a half ago. And so, if the board says, "You know what? We have second thoughts. We don't want a matrix. We're either going to mandate them or we're going to make them optional or recommended," you know, we will we will implement whatever. Um, wherever you decide. I just, I, I feel like having something to guide our decisions. Um, if, if we don't think we're going to go all the way to the extent of following word for word, the CDC, trying to have something that guides our decision, uh, the parents can look at and say, okay, I may not be totally agreeable with it, but at least I understand where they're coming from uh, on some of the stuff versus, Hey, we'll just at any given time, we may change our mind you know, and they're required or at any given time, we may change our mind and they're optional. So that was kind of the gist behind it, but we're, we're open to, you know, whatever the motion is or whatever direction the board wants to take. Yeah. Are there any other questions on the matrix? So I think the question at hand is a couple, um, you know, I've heard a few different thoughts on this. Ultimately, do we want to have this uh, included as part of the back to school matrix? Uh, do we want to start with this? I think we've talked about this being a guide, right? So it is fluid. It may change. We changed our matrix a few, matrix a few times last year. Um, so I think that would be something that we would need to, um, you know, just work to determine as well. Um, so I guess if there aren't any other questions, open to a motion for uh, the board to consider. So Bruce, um, question. Right now with the matrix, there's no way to know if we should be in masks or not. 
because we don't have numbers for students and staff, right? To start the first I, day. I, we do have, I mean, we, we technically would know what our community numbers are. No, but the numbers on the left-hand column. We, we don't have numbers for that column. Unless anybody is reported in at this point in time, I don't know if we have any of that data. Um, we, we, can, we can pull data for you um, that would be cases that would be student-aged children that reside in these different attendance boundaries um, over this last week, but wouldn't necessarily be in our schools because we haven't had school yet. So, but, um, but, but, but also I'm not sure if it would be much different than last year when we started with the matrix as, again, a guiding, a guidepost for us to say, at some point we need to start. And then, you know, if, if we can, if we can come back and look at it in, in the time period that we were discussing, Right. You know, but so I, I guess my, my point is that by adopting this, we're adopting it on the assumption that we're starting without masks. And I think we still need to have a conversation about 4K through 5. We heard from a lot of 4K through 5 parents by email about the fact that they feel like this gives them no choice at all for their kids. And I think, I mean, with all due respect, Kate, COVID is not the flu. I mean, John Hopkins University estimates that worldwide between 300 and 650,000 people die from the flu. Since COVID worldwide, we have 4.5 million deaths from COVID. So to say that COVID is the flu, I just, I think it's part of that. I, re I really feel like what we're hearing from parents, the feedback from parents who, who don't, who aren't in favor of masks, of us requiring masks, it seems like it really falls in three buckets. They either say, I don't believe the science. They say, it's not about the science, it's about my right as a parent. Or they say, hey, no one under 40 in St. Croix County has died of COVID yet. Why are we worrying about this? And I mean, I think so th those three different buckets. And I think, you know, the don't believe the science, the COVID isn't real, COVID is no worse than the flu, Masks don't work, masks aren't safe, vaccines don't work, vaccines aren't safe. And while there are outliers, when you look at the propensity of research and the recommendations of all leading health organizations in this country, they're saying COVID is real, COVID is worse than the flu, masks work, masks are safe, vaccines work, vaccines are safe. So, I mean, there's that that thing. And so I think as a board, you know, each of us has to decide, are we on the, I don't believe the science side or are we on the, I believe the science side, right? Or, or which science, which science? I, I, I don't know if that's the, the question that we need to vote on, but I, I do think well, if you want- that's what we're hearing from a lot of parents that their opposition is around the science. I, they I, don't believe it's real. So I would say that in the email correspondence that we're getting, we're getting a lot of correspondence saying, you know, don't wear masks. We get a lot of correspondence say, um, you know, make them optional. You're getting a lot saying, make sure that everyone's wearing masks, right? So right. It's, sending it's, us links to studies, Bruce, that, it, that would contradict the recommendations of the WHO. Agreed. And, yeah, yeah. Th then currently the back to school plan has masks optional. Mm -hmm. So if you'd like to have something separate from that, then you need to make a motion for the board to vote on here to see if that passes. If that doesn't pass, then we would be at the point where we'll be starting with masks optional. So if that's the motion you'd like to make them, we need to call that to order. So we aren't, there's no time for discussion is what you're saying. It, once the motion is made, then there will be some time for discussion unless there are any other comments or thoughts on that. Uh, back to the point, Heather, that you just made about, we don't know the, the cases in schools right now. Uh, and next response that we could look at data for positive cases of where those students reside, uh, whether or not they attend that school. Um, I would say there are no cases in schools right now because school is not in session. So if a child has COVID, I'm guessing they won't be attending school on Monday. So I, to, to say that we could start mask optional, we would be, in, it would be with the assumption that it would be with a COVID-free environment or it would be asymptomatic cases that a parent wouldn't send their child to school sick um, and obviously a staff member. Um, 
I haven't really said anything just because everybody else has asked the same questions that I was going to ask. Um, I feel a little bit, I, I keep thinking we're looking for a unicorn that doesn't exist. Um, and I think, you know, we've been into this for a year and a half and what we're doing is coming to grips that this is here and it's not going away. Um, here in the sense of this is how our life is. Hudson is not Orlando, Florida. We may get to that. I hope we don't. Um, I think we can take it day by day, week by week, see what happens. I think we have to kind of have this middle ground um, to figure it out. I do have the same questions as you do. What about the kid who has, you know, uses a wheelchair? Can't wear a mask. Um, what about that kid? They have no other alternative. And that parent needs that child to go to school. Um, I think I came in with a mask. I'm not wearing one now. We all have different tolerances of what we are going to, what we can put up with. Um, I think we need to be respectful of those who need to wear a mask and those who do not want to wear a mask. However, we're all going to have to live with our choices that we make. We all, I always said to my kids, you're responsible for what you say and what you do. And I would hope as we send our kids to school that we would look at the population maybe and say, are there kids there who need me to do this? Um, those who know me pretty well know that I don't like being told what to do. It's the worst thing. My husband's sitting over there laughing at me. Don't tell me what to do. I get it. Um, but I also, I really care about our kids in our community. I still go back to that. I care about the people in this room. Some of you I know fairly well from years ago, from now. Um, we don't have to agree, but we do have to get along. And we do need to be reasonable and know that nothing is going to stay the same. It's going to all change. We have no idea. We had no idea this was coming. We don't know what's happening tomorrow. So that's all I have to say. I just need to kind of counter that, Heather. I'm not sure it's a fair characterization for me to say that COVID is not real. It certainly is real. My point was that as the variations continue as they will, we need to look at what the severity is of each of those cases. So Delta is gonna be different than whatever the next one might be or whatever COVID was last year. So that's certainly my point. I can see the emails coming in. I certainly know that COVID is real. Uh, my point was just to, again, look at the severity of each uh, variant. And, and Heather, I think just for calling the question, I, I'm just trying to follow Robert's rules of orders. I, I think the process is that if the, the debate uh, is to happen on the motion, then that's what we would be discussing. Otherwise, uh, I, I feel like we could just continue to talk up here all, all night. And I'm, I'm just trying to keep the meeting moving along here as well. And Jamie would probably be doing a much better job than I am. He just happens to be fishing. So uh, he is online though. So I, I'm, uh, you know, that's all I'm recommending is that if that's the debate that we want to have out, you know, we'll see if there's a, a, a motion, then a second. Oh, Jamie, you want to talk? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I move to approve the matrix as recommended by the administration. That's almost impossible. <laughs> Sorry, bud. Yeah, some type of motion. Uh, we need some, some type of motion, um, and then we would uh, need to vote on that motion and or have a second and then discussion based upon that. Mm -hmm. 
Jamie, if you're trying to talk, we can't hear you. Yeah, I, can you hear me now? Yes. I move to approve the matrix as drafted by the administration. So we have a motion. Do we have a second? Can you repeat that? A, I didn't hear it. He made a, a motion to uh, move for to approve the matrix as brought forward by the administration. And well, what you can do is the motion would be to approve the matrix to basically be part of the back to school plan. And this is. All right, so Jamie, would you uh, amend that to say that we would uh, move to approve the matrix as uh, brought forward by the administration to be part of the back to school blueprint? I assume it would be attached as some type of exhibit A or whatever. Yes, I, I would agree to that. Also, uh, part of my motion is to change the word optional to highly recommended where, wherever it appears. I, I think he, sorry, James. We're going to have to leave it up to probably somebody else that we can understand at the meeting to make a motion, I think. Does somebody else want to make a motion and we'll start with that? I move that we adopt the uh, district's recommended matrix as part of the back to school blueprint. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second by Bob. Uh, so I will, uh, any discussion on that? Do we want to discuss if we would like the wording change to, from mask optional to mask recommended? It won't have any impact, but it would just have a different uh, implication. So if it was mask, uh, what was your word? Recommended. The, if a family really didn't want to, they didn't necessarily have to. Okay. Yeah, nothing would change with their action. It's just. Are you including that as part of your motion? Molly. Oh, Ann. I think, you know, you're right. It doesn't change if a parent should choose that they don't want their child to wear a mask. However, I think when we say recommended, it's looking at the kid who can't wear a mask and saying, well, can I do this? Or is there a point in my day where I'm spending time with this child where I could wear a mask. So I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying recommended, it's pro-social, it says I care about my neighbor. Uh, we're in this together. Um, we're in the same boat. So doesn't change it for those who don't wanna do it, but makes it a little more positive, I think. And to Nick's point earlier, it's, it's the CDC is recommending also, they are not mandating. They're mandated on transportation, public transportation, but just uh, they have not mandated in classrooms or, or indoor spaces yet. They, they have mandated mask and public transportation, which would fall under school buses. However, they have not mandated mask in any other situations uh, as of yet. And I always say as of yet, because they could come in and, and mandate that. So currently we've got a motion on the table uh, that's been seconded. Uh, any other discussion on that motion? Could you just review the motion itself? Does that include the mask recommended? It presently does not include the mask recommended. Can I make a motion to add that to that or do we have to do them separate? You uh, could make a friendly amendment. A request for a friendly amendment. 
Then I would make that request for a friendly amendment. Since it was Carrie's motion, she would have to agree to the friendly Carrie, amendment. do you accept that? Carrie accepts that. Bob, you second that? We're good to go, people. Any other discussion on this before we call a vote? I would like to just say that this is a very difficult um, decision or, or topic, obviously. And, and from a standpoint, when I came on the board and this first started, when we didn't know when, what COVID meant, what it was going to mean, we were warned that schools would be a breeding ground for this virus. And it turned out to, whether it was our mitigation efforts or just the uh, nature of the virus, it was not, did not turn out to be that way. Uh, CDC recommended, if we followed their recommended recommendation at the time, we would have started in virtual last year and would it would have been virtual for quite a while. And I think we all agree that that would have not been what was best for our children at the time. And many school districts did start virtual and stay virtual most of the year. So I look at this decision isn't, isn't based on for or against what the CDC recommends. I recognize the science. I, I believe masks do help. They're part of mitigation efforts. Uh, that's why I'm glad that we, we asked and are implementing this matrix for transparency with our community and our parents. And you know, many things have changed since then. This virus, the Delta virus is more contagious with kids supposedly, or I won't say supposedly, according to, but um, no one had vaccinations back then. Now we have almost 60% of our community vaccinated. And I think there's a trade-off and uh, I, I like this, uh, this motion. Thank you. Any other discussion? Bruce, just one final comment. Um, so I won't vote in support of this and it's primarily because of my discomfort with the elementary schools. Um, we have 60% of those eligible for vaccines vaccinated. So 60% of those over the age of 12 and almost zero unless they were in a study percent of those who are in our four K through five programs. Okay, thank you for your comments. Uh, so we will uh, take the motion to uh, vote. Uh, all those in favor of the motion on the table, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, signify by saying nay. Yeah. And motion passes. And uh, Nick, we will then move to uh, the back to school blueprint. So really, this is just, you know, is there any changes or anything that you want made to the back school blueprint? I think, you know, this is a change to the back school blueprint. So this will be incorporated into the back school blueprint. And then I think what we will also change in the back school blueprint uh, would be wherever we say mask or optional, we say mask rec recommended. Um, if that's if that's OK with you guys. So I just had uh, one comment on the black back to school uh, blueprint, um, specifically regarding the operational side. I think, you know, we talk about following uh, the guidance, but it seemed like last year, maybe we were much more specific and, you know, you had to be tested. Um, and then if it was a certain amount of, of time, you know, you could come back to school if you had a negative test. So can you maybe just talk about what the procedures are there for, how we'll be following and does it make any sense for us to be documenting that more in terms of what happens in that instance? And maybe that was really just more of the close contact. I, I don't yep. um, so actually, um, hopefully I don't catch Erin off guard, but um, since she kind of leads our student service department and has been working with the nurses, a lot of this is laid out in the letters that we send home in our communication, but um, she can kind of walk you through where we're at right at this moment. Do you have a microphone down there for her? So I'm just gonna pull up the letter that we were working on um, for parents this year. Um, but really, I mean, as Nick has mentioned before, leaving close contact tracing up to public health. But um, encouraging parents to get their children tested, 
obviously, sending children home when they're symptomatic, um, but then um, allowing them to come back to school if they are symptom-free for 24 hours. But again, encouraging testing. And, and the biggest thing with that is, is we do know we have seasonal allergies. We do know that we have still the common cold out there. We do know that we have other illnesses like strep throat and, and things along those lines. And so um, we really, and we really want to encourage, you know, we want to be as flexible as we can with parents, but you know, we want kids that aren't feeling well at home and uh, we, we don't want them at school. Um, and, and we need to work through that. We also want to encourage people to, to get the vaccine. I mean, we, I think, uh, as Heather said, um, I believe they work. There's a reason we don't have people in my neighborhood in iron lungs right now and uh, measles outbreaks and things along those lines. I do believe they work. And I think it's our best defense against, um, against this, this situation. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's part of our plan in recommending that. And that's a requirement also of the federal government as it relates to the ESSER and uh, funding that we, that we do get. Um, but uh, we, want to, we want to be flexible, but we also want to make sure that we're not having sick kids coming to school. And, and that's nothing new. Um, we've been pushing for parents since we've had schools to not send sick kids to school. And do we realize that some parents may still send sick kids to school? Yes. Um, and, you know, as we have to deal with that, you know, we will have uh, spaces in the nurses' offices uh, and in the schools, just like we did last year, where if kids are dis uh, uh, displaying two or more symptoms, you know, on the COVID list, where they can kind of be isolated till a parent can come pick them up. Uh, so it's, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, you've gotten rid of all your mitigation strategies. We haven't gotten rid of all the mitigation strategies. It's just a lot of them have just become a common practice for us that aren't necessarily always needing to be outlined uh, in, in the plan. And so um, we are still doing those things if we have, if we have sick kids. And uh, uh, I believe St. Croix County, uh, their latest recommendation is, is you would not be considered a close contact if you are vaccinated and symptom free. So even a household in close contact would not be considered a co close contact if you're vaccinated and symptom free, um, according to how they are going to handle things. Uh, so um, we do, I would say our highest risk population is when there's a positive case in the household. There's just no doubt about it. I mean, it's just what we see. And so we hope that parents take that very serious, that if they have one child that ends up testing positive, they keep the other child home, they follow the, the guidelines of the quarantine related to um, the public health. We have told public health, we have, uh, we will honor their quarantines. If they tell us that somebody's in quarantine, we will expect them to be at home. If parents drop them off at school, we'll expect them to come pick them up. Um, we will honor their quarantines. Uh, we are told by our legal counsel that we are expected to honor orders and quarantines. And uh, we are not going to, we're not going to violate that. And if people are mad, then they just, I guess are mad, but we will follow public health's orders um, on quarantines and, and things along those lines. Other questions? Yep. Am I on? Okay. Um, my question was uh, related to absences because this is day-to-day -day under operations. Absences due to quarantine or illness will be treated like all regular school absences. Students would work at the classroom teacher on missed assignments. Staff would use their regular sick leave. So does that mean, um, so if they're in quarantine, do, I mean, do we actually have a number of sick days that kids are allowed before they're considered truant? No, so I mean, how does no. that so work? What we're saying by that is um, there won't be IDL if you're. It if won't you're, be IDL. There, they won't be individual right. distance learning. What we're saying is we would handle it the same way we handled things pre COVID. If a kid was out with mono or a kid was out with strep or a kid was out with RSV, you know, the parent would work with the school, work with the teachers, we'd get work sent home, opportunity for people to, you know, come pick it up and do those types of things. That, that's, that's what we mean by that. Obviously, um, when you have illness related uh, situations, it's documented or quarantined. Um, when it comes to truancy or attendance, we'll, you know, we'll definitely take a new account. Okay. So the other question I have is if we are not masking, we would or if a parent, most people don't, kids get sick, they're going to catch things, they're going to get strep throat, they're going to get whatever. Um, 
and I know kind of, you know, you go through those times when you have your kids that are, they just seem like, are they sick? <laughs> you know, are they really sick? So how are we, are we kind of, I don't know what I'm asking exactly. Are we saying to parents, we want you to err on the side of keeping your kid home? Absolutely. I mean, err on the side of caution. I mean, that okay. helps all of us out. It, you know, if you feel like, you know, my kid's complaining of a scratchy throat and they right. got a runny nose, go get them tested. So you know? what does then the follow through from a teacher? Um, because it's, it is really hard to get work, you know, from a teacher. I'll just, it is really hard. Um, or you come back and you've been gone for a few days and you have, like, you get back and they're like, take this test. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, 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 so are we going to, are we going to do anything different in that sense? Are we going to be like, Hey, you know, we're going to really try and work more proactively with people with the kids. If they're gone and they're quarantined, that's 10 days. That's a heck of a long time. Yeah. We, we, well, um, currently we don't expect kids to come back from illness and take a test the first day they're back. Unless I'm wrong on that. I mean, there's time to make up the work. And if we have staff members that are requiring them to do that, then that's something that parents need to reach out to the staff member or building principal and talk to them about, uh, because that would not be our expectation. Uh, the other thing is, is kids can test out of quarantine between days five and seven, come back on day seven. Okay. And so, you know, and a lot of times what happens with quarantine is rarely is somebody out for the full quarantine amount of time, because a lot of times people that are sick, um, don't get, te they're not getting tested right away. So, um, the people they're around maybe already were at school for a couple of days when they could have normally been in quarantine. Uh, so, it was rare that we were having kids out for long periods of time. Now where it got really kind of dicey is where you would have uh, household cases and they couldn't um, isolate from one another. Mm -hmm. And you had quarantines that were stacked on top of each other. And um, I think public health is really trying to work to not have that it, it happen as often. So do we have any thoughts about what if for some reason, everything cases go nuts and we're at the point where it's like, we have tons of kids out. Are we going to, you know, ramp up an IDL or is that basically we're, that that's gone for now? You know, I, you know, I talked to Dave about looking into what are some of our options, especially at K-5. I mean, at the, at the middle of school, high school level, I mean, high school level, we definitely have obviously our virtual academy. It's been up and running. It's a virtual charter. It's pretty easy to move kids into that if we had to do that. Um, but at the elementary, it's just, it's a much, much more difficult thing. I mean, it's because virtual learning for elementary kids is not great. I mean, whether it's synchronous, asynchronous, it doesn't really matter. I mean, there's a reason why schools for a long time have been in person face to face. Um, I mean, if we got to a point where things are so bad that we just can't even keep our doors open, then yes, we will, uh, we will make adjustments as needed. Uh, obviously we've learned quite a bit from last year and we can probably adjust a little bit better than we've been able to, you know, even when it was the April before when we basically had March before when we got three days notice that basically we had to, um, you know, shut it down. Uh, but I would say as of right now, I think the expectation would be as long as we can staff our buildings, we would want our kids face-to-face -face instruction. Um, we would, rather see, you know, start laying on, even, you know, layering on more and more mitigation strategies if needed before we go to the point where we're going to hybrid or uh, virtual instruction, as long as we can continue to staff our buildings. Any other, Heather. Nick, can you talk a little bit about our plans around distancing? I mean, when you look at CDC's guidance, they talk about masking, they talk about social distancing, and then testing, ventilation, hand washing. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know, especially if you're serving children who aren't eligible for the vaccine, yeah. that, that distancing, and yet I think I only saw distancing reference when it comes to lunch lines. It's yep. not its own category. So what, what is our approach yeah. to social distancing? So we, we've had that conversation with staff, especially the elementaries, you know, try to get on, get on necessary furniture out of rooms, get desks spaced apart as best as you can. The same thing at the high school and the middle school. Um, we know that, and, you know, unless we go into like a hybrid model, it's going to be impossible for us to get six feet between kids all the time, uh, which we're, we're, we can be pretty close. The reason lunch lines are, are kind of brought into play is because that tends to be some of our 
our big lines, you know, so making sure people are conscious. I know our teaching staff, the elementary, when they're lining kids up in the hall, just like last year, the expectation is they're going to be long lines. They're going to try to keep, you know, keep kids apart. They do a great job. We're going to continue with their hand washing. You probably noticed tonight the room is somewhat cold. Uh, the buildings are cold because we're running tremendous amounts of fresh air in our buildings and you can't just pump fresh air in without uh, either cooling it or heating it before you bring it in. And so in an in the summer, you have to cool it. So you're just bringing so much more air in. It's so much cooler. Um, so we are, we've ramped up our fresh air intake. You know, I know in all of the buildings, I think we're exchanging air almost uh, at least seven times an hour uh, where we're, we're cycling through the air in the buildings. So we're ramping, we were ramped up the ventilation. We've had those conversations. So that's, and that's what they've told us, especially indoors is probably one of the best things we can do, especially with the Delta variant, because it reduces the amount of viral load that's floating around in the air. And so we'll continue to do that where we run into some challenges uh, when we have really, really cold days in the winter. Uh, there's only so much fresh air we can bring into the buildings because if we bring in too much fresh air, it'll freeze up our systems and then we're in a really, really, really bad spot. So, you know, it's a balancing act. People ask about opening windows, um, like this building, for example, we don't have operable windows. You can't open windows in this building. Um, uh, and the reason is, is because we have an air handling system that should be able to handle bringing in the fresh air. Um, and we'll continue to do those things. I know teachers are planning on having things outside and, and, and keeping kids, you know, apart and uh, into the best of their ability. But, um, you know, it's, we, we had plexiglass last year. People said, where's the plexiglass? Well, over the course of the year, as the study came out, as studies come out, plexiglass was more of a feel good um, barrier. It, it provided, according to the research, very little, if any type of, of real barrier. I mean, we still see it in stores. We still see it in different places, but you know, what the research is telling us is it doesn't really provide a whole lot of protection. And so, you know, the plexiglass isn't out. Do we still have it? Yes. I mean, if it gets to the point where we're either going to have to go virtual or throw everything we have at this thing, including the kitchen sink, yeah, we'll bring the plexiglass out if we have to. But, um, you know, so all of these things have been have been looked at and, and as we're trying to trying to mitigate our risk. Um, and like I said, the masks, you know, are obviously a key piece and we'll have to kind of see how that goes as the year goes on. Well, then I guess what I would ask is on that day-to-day -day page of our back to school blueprint, mm -hmm. perhaps as a little bit of reassurance to parents of kiddos who have not yet been able to be vaccinated, um, that, that if we could add physical distancing as a, a fourth headline and just that, you know, physical distancing of three feet will be maintained whenever possible mm -hmm. or something like that. I think to have that in the blue print would, it's great that you're planning on it, but I think to have it physically or actually be in print would be, um, would be appreciated. Yeah, and we can absolutely add it and I'll trace and make a note of it and we can absolutely make that adjustment to the blue print. Absolutely. Any other questions? Well, um, I'm wondering, so if, if you, let me think about this. If you have a person who's vaccinated in a household, like say there's four people and two are vaccinated and two aren't, the two are vaccinated, do not have to quarantine, correct? Uh, the two vaccinated, as long as they are symptom free. Symptom free. They okay. don't have to quarantine. Are they so going to have For example, to? in the Olet house, I have two children that aren't eligible for the vaccine yet. And uh, my oldest is and has been vaccinated. And I'm vaccinated. My wife's vaccinated. And uh, should somebody test positive for COVID in their house, our two youngest have to quarantine. Okay. My oldest, as long as he's symptom free, could still go to school. Okay. And if it wasn't me that tested positive, I could still come to work as long as I was symptom free. And do they? So I assume that the public health department is communicating all this with them when when they communicate when they, with positive cases yeah. and so they're giving them instructions and do they have to show like a proof of vaccination or anything like that or is it just kind of a um well you gotta understand everybody that's been vaccinated is in the statewide vaccination database oh. so they can they can validate it okay you know they can look in and say i just was curious how that would work yep, like they can look in and say you know has so-and-so been vaccinated no they haven't they're not in the registry. They have to quarantine. Okay. Good or job. they they have been vaccinated. They don't have to quarantine. And you know, people say, "Well, gosh, that seems very big, big brother esque." 
-hmm. But I mean, we've been keeping vaccination registries for measles, for mumps, for Mm -hmm. rubella. I mean, for it's just added to that registry that we already have on children. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for that detail. Uh, Nick, with with some kids wearing masks, some kids not wearing masks at the beginning of the school year, and some. I mean, are we really doing some training as far as recognizing bullying and from either side and addressing that strongly? You know, and I can defer to either Dave or Aaron, because I know they have been working with the principals and talking through that on what we've been instructing with staff. Yeah, we have been talking about that with principals. And, and like we've said tonight already, it's been remarkably positive. We haven't had a lot of incidents, but it's something we're aware of. And we'll make sure that uh, we'll get out in front of it if anything should occur. Any other questions about the uh, back to school blueprint? So what I'm what I'm hearing the board say is what the adjustments they'd like to uh, have made, and I guess somebody can say so moved if they want, but would be we'll change the spots in the blueprint to be recommended instead of optional. Um, we'll also add the column that talks about we're going to try to social distance three feet to the best of our ability, but we may not always be able to do that. Um, and then obviously as part of the back school blueprint with your previous motion and, and approval is the school clo- uh, the school mass matrix becomes part of the back to school blueprint. Uh, is that sound like what I heard people say they want changes as far as the back school blueprint goes? I'm seeing head nods as uh, yes. Okay. With that, uh, any, if there aren't any other questions, I would take a motion to adjourn. We have a motion from Carrie. A second from Molly. That was the longest I would say it's ever taken to adjourn. For goodness sake, we are adjourned.